we are on the fifth look at the rewards of faith, the rewards that God gives to people of faith. And I'd like you to, to read this to me. Okay. And without faith, it is impossible to please him for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So we're, for, we're focusing on the fact that God rewards those who seek him. And I'm focusing on this because I see a lot of people struggle in, in coming to God because they don't believe he rewards us for doing that. The seventh reward that I'm focusing on, I'm calling it eternal joyful realness. Okay? So, eternal means it's of another kind to what we have in this lifetime. It's vastly superior. Joyful, and this is something that's taken a long time for me to accept, is it's the ultimate happy, satisfying pleasure that we could ever imagine. And realness means fully being exactly who we are. And this also is a, a difficult thing because we're so used to role-playing, even in churches. It's all about role-playing and acting like you're a good Christian. So, eternal. Let's look at this reward that those who seek God have to believe that there's a reward waiting for us that is of an eternal nature. Not just that I'm going to get things I want now. So, in Isaiah 57, verse 15, it says, For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, there's only one like that. He's, he is named that. He is the one. He's the only one who is high and lifted up. Nobody you can think of, nobody you'll meet is going to be as good as him. So listen to what he says. A significant quality about God is he inhabits eternity. Those who seek him have to believe that there's a reward of an eternal nature because he inhabits eternity. It's where he lives. So part of this isn't about everlastingness, but that eternity is a different place. So we, when we seek God, it's like we are reaching into eternity and part of our belief that he rewards those who seek him is there's an eternal reward. And so we don't measure everything by this lifetime. In Ecclesiastes 3 verse 11, it says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. Some of you remember the chorus. In his time, in his time, he makes everything beautiful in his time. That's where it comes from. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart. I believe that the reason that man wants to explore the universe is because eternity is in our hearts and we know there's something more than earth. The reason people will try every kind of spirituality except Christianity is they don't want God, but something in them says there's something beyond the material realm. Well, it's because God's put eternity into our hearts. It doesn't mean that we'll, we'll live with him. It just means there's something about him that he's put into our hearts. And that's why we, we age and we never feel like that part inside us is getting old. It's because he's put eternity in there. And so it doesn't feel like what time would feel like. It doesn't feel like what matter feels like, like our bodies feel separate from that thing inside us because he's put eternity inside us. So I just want you to think that way that the, the reward of those who seek him is we get satisfaction to the eternity he's put into us where all the people who don't seek him run aimlessly after every kind of spirituality because they just don't get it that eternity is an issue with God, where we do get it. He's put it in our hearts, and he rewards us with eternal things. Yet, so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. That is the human condition outside of Christ. 
We have eternity in our hearts, which makes us always want more, but we can never figure out why. If you read any of the stuff that evolutionists are writing to try and explain life and the universe without God, it's driving them crazy because they have to try and explain it from a standpoint where they don't understand there's eternity in our hearts. And they come up with the stupidest things because they can't find out. They cannot find it out. The New Testament talks about that mystery that has been hidden. The only reason we know that mystery is because God has made it known to us. So I just want you to think this way. There is a part of us, even sinners have that, that eternity is in our hearts. We can't figure it out ourselves. But those who earnestly seek him there are rewards of an eternal nature. And so part of what we're looking for when we see God is way bigger than, you know, am I getting the job I want or am I getting a promotion or, you know, anything. It's way bigger than that. So he's put eternity into man's heart, and so we are looking for eternal rewards. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And that's why as Christians, we're not looking at, do we have a good life now? We're looking at, I have eternal life. Which again, it's not saying that it hasn't, I don't have it, and that it's future. It means, I've got it already. I've got a life that is eternal, that once I am done with this temporary dwelling place, I am going home. I have a forever home. I'm a stranger. I'm a foreigner here. This earth is not my home. Well, it's, it's because he's given us eternal life that we can say that eternity he's put in our hearts, I recognize that it is satisfied in the eternal life I'm given in Christ. And so those who come to him believing that he exists, believing the gospel, believing in Jesus, they are rewarded with eternal life. And so we're satisfied with that. Psalm 73, I've talked about this this week. Beautiful expression of this. Asaph says, Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will receive me to glory. When we start here with nevertheless, it's a, it's a switch in thoughts. So some translations just say yet. In other words, based on what's before, now it's yet. This is true. So I want you to, to see what just comes before this, and I'll, I'll just backtrack to the beginning. Asaph was in a place where he, he felt like he was slipping because he was envying the wicked. He was looking at just the moment. In the moment, it seems like the wicked always prosper. Why is that? And he was envying them that their life seems so much easier than those who want to live for God. That's not a new problem. <laughs> okay? Now he's, he's going to describe what that was like for him, and that'll bring us to this. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart. Okay? When he was envying the wicked... His whole soul had become bitter. So his mind was believing things that weren't true, that the wicked had it so much better off than us. His heart was pumping those thoughts through his soul, and his soul became bitter. It's like his, his mind was making the water bitter. The, the heart was pumping that spring of bitter water through his soul. Now his whole soul was bitter. Anyone know what that feels like? that you are just consumed with being bitter. That's what he's saying. When I was pricked in heart, I, I, I think of a big thorn that if it went through your heart, it would stop your heart. If it didn't kill you, it would stop your heart from being able to properly pump. Right? So my soul is embittered because my heart has been pierced and it's not working properly because all I can see is the wicked are prospering and the righteous don't prosper. Then he says, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. And all I can see when I 
think of this as driving down one of the country roads and there's a herd of cattle on the road and you want to try and get past them. And you're courteous. You drive to the other side of the road. No. <laughs> they'll just keep going in front. Like they don't have any sense. And Asaph is taking that and saying, that's what I was like when I envied the wicked. Nevertheless, brings it to something different, which is, guess what I found out about God the moment I came to my senses? Okay? I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. So here he's just coming out of a stupor where he was envying the wicked, and what does he find God doing? He's right there. He found out, I, I was continually with you. You were holding my right hand to keep me from slipping. No wonder I almost slipped rather than I slipped. Because he was holding my right hand. And he's, he's guiding me with his counsel. He took me into the sanctuary and with his counsel about what happens to the wicked in the judgment, he guided me out of that mess. And afterward, you will receive me to glory. So part of us believing that God rewards those who seek him is, this is what I'll experience in this lifetime, even while the wicked prosper, but afterward, I get this reward. I, I saw what happens to them. What happens to me is, I will be received into glory. I will be received. And, and Asaph had a clear picture that the wicked will not be received. As soon as God reminded him what's going to happen to them, he wanted no more. I don't want to be like them anymore. And that is a cure, you know, when we're drawn to envy the wicked today, is to just say, do you want to end up where they end up? Be part of the picture. God rewards those who seek him with glory. So, part of this last look at a reward is, it is an eternal reward. And when you grasp that, that even if you don't see things happening in the world around you, but you believe that God will reward you with something eternal and lasting that cannot be taken away, sometimes that gets you through the things that don't look right, where the wicked prosper. Everything goes well. The wrong guys get in government and, and countries are going downhill and everybody celebrates it. Yeah, but I have an eternal reward. I'm not looking for my party to get in. I'm not looking for Canada to be a better place. I'm not looking for righteousness to fill our country. I'm looking for the eternal reward. I want people to leave the nation and come into the kingdom where there's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And so our eternal thinking radically changes our ideas and then we actually do celebrate that I'm sure glad this isn't my home I'm really glad uh, the election yesterday it's like I am so glad this isn't my home because there's no one to vote for <laughs> no one that I could say I am for that person because they have the best interests of our province at, at heart there's just no one it's like but I'm going to seek God because there's an eternal reward and no politician can keep us from having it. It's a joyful reward, okay? And this is mind-blowing to some of us to know how joyful God is. So, if, if we are going to have the faith that pleases God, we must believe that he exists as a joyful person and that he rewards those who seek him with joy. We have to believe that. Because if he is the most joyful person who exists, and you keep coming to him saying, God, I know you're such an unhappy person, and I know I would be unhappy if I really followed you. You think you're going to please him? I'm praying, right? God should be pleased I'm praying while I'm telling him all these lies about him. So we have to believe he exists as a joyful person, and that he rewards us with joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. So let's look at that. In Matthew 25, we know the parable of the three servants where the master was going away on a journey. Um, 
symbolizing Jesus, who's away from the church right now. And he gave one servant five talents of money, another two talents of money, another one talent of money. Uh, one of them squandered it. Uh, it's interesting to think of this as three church people, not three Christians, but three church people. <laughs> You know, uh, people claim to be followers of Christ. So we're all given something and we're supposed to bear fruit. Two of the servants simply multiplied what they were given. They served their master by doing his business. It earned them interest. It earned them, you know, greater production, however you look at it. They produced more with what they were given. So in Matthew 25, 21 and 23... We get what Jesus says to the servant who multiplied his five talents into ten talents and the servant who multiplied his two talents into four talents. The emphasis is you don't have to be like somebody else to multiply your gifts. You don't have to be like someone else to be a fruitful person. It's what have you been given? Is it bearing fruit? And this is what Jesus said to those two servants indicating when he returns, okay, and, and there's a judgment, this is what he would say. Enter into the joy of your master. When I read that, does that feel rewarding to you? Or does something negative come up and tell you that's not what it's going to be like for you? Because the message is, that God is a joyful person and he wants us to be ready for him, just serving him. Doesn't matter if you're able to produce as much as another person. It's, are you taking what you've been given and are you serving him for the bearing of fruit? Are people being blessed because you're simply serving him? And Jesus is saying, this is what I'm going to be like when you see me. When I come back, I'll be saying, well done. Not in the sense of legalism or works, just you are being about my business. Now come and enter into my joy. And right away we have to say, do you believe that Jesus exists as a joyful master? Or is he a taskmaster, a slave driver? Like this is huge, whether we believe he exists as a joyful person, because then only if I believe he exists as a joyful person, could I believe he will reward me with the joy. It's the joy of your master. Enter into his joy. So I want you to just think about that. I know it might take some meditation to to renew our minds with this, but this is what we would expect is going to be our reward simply because we're people who seek God. Psalm 16 verse 11 says, you make known to me the path of life. So the writer's saying, you know, whatever the path of life is, you make it known to me. I believe that's the way we can live every day, get in the word, listen to God, watch for what he's doing. He'll make known to you the path of life. I'll make known to you the way you should go. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. If you're going to come to God by faith and please him, you have to believe that he exists in the fullness of joy. When we actually prefer addictions, we're telling God, I could find fuller joy somewhere else, right? If I would rather be somewhere else, I'm telling God, you are not the fullness of joy because I'm happier when I watch this or I'm with that person or, you know, whatever I do. So I have to believe that in God's presence, there is fullness of joy for me to believe he would reward me with joy. Okay? At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So, we seek God for the eternal reward that 
at his right hand, there's this never-ending reality. There's pleasures forever. Everything we say we have to do instead of getting to know God, the pleasure is temporary. Every one of them. And, and I, I mean, with addiction, we all know this, that we adjust to the thing we're addicted to so that we need more. Like, the, the pleasure we got the first time, it, it's not there the second time, so we have to go more. And then it stops, and then you, oh man, I need that because the pleasure's all gone. And God's saying, but because in his presence there's fullness of joy, at his right hand are all the pleasures you could ever desire forever. And so you seek him knowing he will reward me with that. And I love this, that at his right hand, the right hand being a symbol of strength, nobody can take this away from him. He's emphasizing, if I have a strong side, which I don't, but let's just use that imagery for you poor humans, at my right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. They're mine. No one's taking that. The other side is, where is Jesus seated? He's at the right hand of the Father. I think that's just a prophetic picture of Jesus' exaltation to the right hand of the Father. Where are you going to find pleasures forevermore? In Jesus. So you seek Jesus now because this is your reward. I seek to know him as my greatest pleasure, like the treasure in the field that we talk about all the time. That in our joy, we have to have the kingdom because this is what we get. And even though there's struggles now and heartaches and sorrows now, we seek God because there's an eternal, joyful reward. When Jesus said to those servants, enter into the joy of your master, a lot of those Jewish people may have had this come to mind. You enter into the joy of your master because in his presence there is fullness of joy. At his right hand there's pleasures forevermore. So serve him faithfully now, even when you're ridiculed and mocked and persecuted and, and you suffer for it, because you know God rewards those who earnestly seek him with eternal joyfulness. And so we'll put up with anything in this lifetime to have that when Jesus returns. In John 15, very familiar verse to us now, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Guess what? Some of that happened the moment we believed in Jesus. We believed in Jesus because part of us knew that believing in him was way better than not believing in him. We already are growing in this. If we're abiding in Christ as a vine in the branches, his joy is already coming into us. It could be that we're such joyless people we haven't noticed how much, because it's taken so long to notice that anything's happening, but it's still there. And now we can say, in this lifetime, even though I'm harassed at every turn, I know there's coming a day when Jesus, who is at the right hand of, of the Father, his joy will be so completely in me that my joy will be completely full. So I seek him, believing that's my reward. I will have more joy today for seeking him, but there's coming an eternal joy that makes all the troubles with seeking him and living for him now seem so small. So there's an eternal joyful realness, and the realness is a significant part of this because for me, I grew up in a home where I couldn't be real. I didn't even know what it meant to be my real self because I only knew how to survive. 
I've been in all kinds of churches where people don't know how to be real because you're just being called to play a role, be a Sunday school teacher, be a youth leader, be a pastor, be a missionary, be somebody outwardly, no matter how you're doing inside. And the church has virtually ignored what it means to be a real person. And I think some churches would even mock the idea that you're bringing psychology in to talk about being real, as if that is worldly. And I want to very quickly show you how significant it is that you are going to be real in eternity. Okay? Genesis 1.26, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. That is the starting place for being a real person. God said, let us make man in our image. Until you get back to that, you can't be real. The world is just a big mirage. Satan has everybody deceived. Nobody's real. So, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them, which means the maleness and the femaleness of being man is in the image of God. Somehow, the two together. To be a real person, I have to know who I am as a male or female. And then believe that whatever's broken about that, in heaven it'll be all put back together. We can experience freedom, healing, growth in all of that. But to be fully our real selves as a, as a human being... That was God's intention from the beginning. Okay? Romans 1.29, for those whom he foreknew, and what foreknew means, and uh, the message this morning, he talked about knowing is very intimate, personal. Okay? That just means that God knew us beforehand. It doesn't say he knew anything about you. A lot of people water this down and say, well, God knew I would be saved. It doesn't say he knew something about you. It says he knew you before. The people he knew before, okay, those people, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. We seek God believing he will reward us with full conformity to the image of his son because he's predestined us to it. I believe he exists as the God who knew me beforehand and predestined me to conformity to the image of his son and he cannot fail to do that. He can't. So I seek him believing I will one day be like Jesus. Okay? in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So in order that Jesus would be the firstborn brother among many brothers. So that's why Jesus or God predestined people like us to be conformed to the image of his son. So that this would actually happen. 2 Corinthians 3, 18. And we all with unveiled face... A non-believer has a veiled face, meaning there, there's a blindness. They just cannot see what we see. When we become Christians, and we talked about this, was it last prayer meeting, I guess, about um, we believe in order to understand, not we understand in order to believe. As soon as we believe, the veil is taken away. That's why when we finally give in to Jesus, we suddenly can see. And now everything about God makes sense. So now we, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, so by faith we see the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ in what he has done, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. So while we might see, I'm making such little progress, and I blew this today, and I blew that today, God's saying, do you know what I see? I see the people I knew beforehand, whom I predestined into the adoption of sons, so that they could be brothers to the Lord Jesus Christ, who will one day be fully conformed to the image of my son, and what I see every day in your miserable situation is, I am transforming you from one degree of glory to another. And sometimes a de degree of glory 
is so still inside a whole bunch of not like Jesus stuff that we don't see it. But God's saying, but this is the way to think about it. If you seek me today, I will reward you by transforming you from one degree of glory to another to that day when you are like my son. That's why you keep seeking, seeking me. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. In other words, Paul's saying, this is my idea. I, I didn't dream up this stuff. It comes from the Holy Spirit who is God's presence to us. So we are being transformed. This being is this earthly life. It's not going to be finished yet. So your every day of your life, you are rewarded by being transformed. Just seek God, and you'll be continually, you'll just keep being transformed. And then 1 John 3, 2, Beloved, we are God's children now. Okay? Settled issue. If you're God's child, you believe all the rewards are yours. And what we will be has not yet appeared. In other words, there's something I'm waiting for. It hasn't happened yet. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Why? Because those God foreknew before time began, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, and on the sixth day of creation, they said, it's time to make man in our own image and in our own likeness. And then he came to sinners and he saved us out of the, the domain of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his beloved son. And now we're being transformed from one degree of glory to another until this day when Jesus appears and we will be like him. Because that's the plan. <laughs> and if I believe God exists as the sovereign over the whole universe, then he cannot fail to do the plan. So it's not our idea. It, it's not at the mercy of us at all. And the reason we become like him is we finally see him as he is. We will be like him. I'll just share this quick, okay? For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. We suffer in this lifetime. Our, our North American climate is changing where Christians will probably start suffering more in this lifetime. And Paul's saying, I, I can tell you what it's like as somebody who suffers at every turn. Every town I go into, I suffer. I get beat up. I get rocks thrown at me. I get thrown in jail. I get beaten. Uh, how many times have I had the 39 lashes across my back? And he's saying, okay, do you know what it's like? The sufferings of this present time are not even worth wasting time trying to compare to the glory that is to be revealed. And so we're supposed to go to God expecting that realness of glory. Okay? And so the Asaph, he said, and after your word, you will receive me to glory. I just, I love those themes <laughs> throughout the scripture. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, for now we see in a mirror dimly. People didn't have glass mirrors back in, in this time. They would polish some kind of metal, depending on your wealth status, would determine what quality of metal you might use to polish, might determine whether you had servants who could spend enough time polishing something that you could get a reflection of yourself. And Paul's saying, right now in this lifetime, it's like a polished metal. It's, it's a dim reflection of who you really are. If you feel that way, you're right where you should be. That right now, it all doesn't make its fullest sense, okay? But then, face to face... I love photography, I love showing pictures to people, but when I go through pictures, it's not the same as being with a person. You know, when someone's gone and all you have left is pictures, you still miss them like crazy because you want face to face. And, and God's saying, this is what the present life is. It's like looking dimly in a mirror, but one day, 
the reward that's waiting for those who seek him is you will see face to face. And this is what happens. So now I know in part, just the parallel there of the Jewish mind, then I shall know fully. To know fully has got to be one of the most gratifying things we can ever imagine. And he says, even as I have been fully known. We're going to know fully the way God knows because we shall be like him. All of this is telling us that there is eternal, joyful realness for those who see God. And part of our seeking him in this earthly time where things don't work well is I have an eternal reward. You have a bad day where everybody made you miserable, but you have a joyful reward. You struggle with being your real self because you don't even know what that is. Guess what? You have realness coming like you can never imagine. You know how people say, I, I can't let people get to know what I'm really like because I know what they will do. They will be ashamed of me and they will reject me. Heaven will be, enter into the joy of your master and be yourself. Amen.